And before we get going, and really the subtitle is Being at Ease in a Topsy-Turvy World. Can you agree with me that we're in a topsy-turvy world? Give me some reasons why we're in a topsy-turvy world. Wrong is right and right is wrong. Wrong is right and right is wrong. That's pretty topsy-turvy. Where the, and the Bible talks about that, that in the last days, there are going to be people, they're going to, and even pastors, it just talks about shepherds, are going to be calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. And that's what makes it topsy-turvy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But give me some specific, uh, some other specific reasons why. Is my light on? Yes? Okay. So give me some specific reasons why are things that are topsy-turvy. Ah, oh, that's a great one. Gender identification. Uh, it's, again, that's the wrong is right and right is wrong. Um, somebody else? Yes. God is taken out of our world. Somebody else? The political separation. Political separation. And, and the divide is getting greater, isn't it? And the more we talk about racism, the more racist we become. So there's a lot of things going on in our world. And uh, I'm finding that Christians are disrupted in their own hearts. They're, they're unsettled, is a good way to put it. The, and I thought, we need to talk about this. We need to talk how we can have a life that's ordered and why that's important in our world. And this picture, I think, uh, speaks well of, of it. Isn't this a great picture? It's called Christ Asleep in His Boat. And the, what I like about, about the painting itself is the, the roughness of the water. And then we have the disciples that are struggling to keep things going. And there's Jesus asleep. And I want to dive into what this all means and how, not that we would sleep, but we would have the heart of rest in our lives. And so we're going to be looking at, at that. And we're going to start with Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, which is this story, the story of, Jesus in the boat. And it starts this way. One day, he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Now, this is the lake of uh, Tiberias, or uh, uh, Sea of Galilee. And this is on the, along the northern part of the lake. He said, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Just a little side part, you know, it's, it's interesting that they were afraid at the beginning of the, of the account and they were afraid at the end of the account. They were afraid at the beginning of the account that they were losing their lives. They were afraid at the end of the account that, that with, filled with fear and awe at what God, what Jesus, the power that he had in order to calm the waves and the raging seas. And let me tell you something, he's still God and he still calms seas. He still calm seas. And so we're going to be looking at that today. This is a picture, and those of us that have been to Israel have seen this. It's called the Jesus boat. This is a frame that's holding a boat that they found in the mud along the Sea of Galilee. It was submerged. A couple of fishermen were out doing their thing, and they stumbled on this uh, boat that was sunken, and they dug it out. and It was really quite a find. And because this boat dates to the first century, they call it the Jesus boat, not necessarily because Jesus was in the boat. Uh, he could have been, but we don't know that. But this boat dates to the first century. And I put it up here to give you maybe an indicator of what the boat may have looked like. Let me go back here. You can see that it's not too big because you can count the people in the back, right? There's probably 15 people there. And there were 12, 13 people at least in the boat. So here they were in the boat. Now, the Bible doesn't say 
what size the boat was, but certainly they were in a boat, and the boats back then were not cruise liners. And so they were on a lake, going across the lake, and the storm came up, and here they were in this boat. And there's several things here I just want to point out. First of all, I want you to note the, the cramped quarters of the boat, right? You're getting all those people in there trying to save trying to save the ship that's going down. The Bible says they were taken on water. It was quite uh, uh, quite extensive, and they were afraid, all right? And so I want you to note here that this was a, the divine order was that there was a storm. There wasn't a sin that Jesus was with them. They were on their way to the other side. In fact, it was Jesus who said, let's go to the other side. So it's not as if they were in a disobedient state. And what I'm trying to share with you is this. Storms will come into our lives. Storms happen. And we, when we see these storms come up, we have to recognize that some of the storms that we go through will be by divine order. That God will do some things in our lives, and he does things for a divine purpose. And so what we need to do is, as, as the, the end result of our time, hopefully we'll have an ordered world in our hearts so that we can go through those times. And, the, and so it was a divine order, that, and storms indeed do happen. And the disciples knew their craft. They were very skilled. This is not their first time out on the water. And the Sea of Galilee was known for having storms come in quite because it was surrounded by mountains, and storms would come in in a moment's notice and create uh, huge waves. And, and so these, these men, these disciples, they knew their craft. They knew, uh, when I put that down there, I thought, yeah, they knew the boat, but they also knew their skill. And so this was not something unusual for them. Jesus, I want you to know here, he fell asleep before the storm. It says, as they were going, Jesus fell asleep. I love that part because he had been just going through a day of ministry. He was tired and he was rested and, and resting. And as he was resting, he was basically delegating to those who knew how to run the boat to run the boat. Just This is not part of the, the outline, but let me just throw this in. I think delegating is an important aspect to having a calm heart. Let those people who know what they're doing do what they know to do. And certainly Jesus did that here. Going back to Jesus, as the storm rose, he still, he still felt comfortable enough to sleep. He was indeed at rest. That, to me, is an amazing thing. If I was in that boat... And that little boat, all these guys are screaming, they're hollering, the wind, the, the waves, all of that's going on, and he still was sleeping. He was at rest. And we'll come back to that. The disciples, fear set in. When it was beyond them, then they turned to Jesus, and Jesus brought peace. And this is important. He brought peace because he had peace. He brought peace because he had peace. I want you to understand what we can bring to a world that's in disarray is peace. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have peace. If we, we cannot give what we do not have. Grasp that. Jesus was able to calm the waves because he was at peace. He was able to bring peace because he had it. We want to affect our world. We want to affect when I say our world, certainly we think of the max world, but the micro world, your world, your home, your neighborhood, your family. You, know, you have an opportunity to bring peace. And one of the main reasons why we want to have an ordered private world is so that we can be people of peace to a world that needs it. All right, we'll talk more about that as we go along here. So why was Jesus able to be at rest even in the storm? This is the question that has launched this whole thing. And we're going six weeks on this. Why was Jesus able to rest even in the midst of the storm? Matthew chapter 11 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Have you ever looked up that word rest? All right. It means a repose. It means to remain. It means to be refreshed, to take ease, refresh, and to rest. All right. Now, if you look at the word rest and out of Vine's expository of dictionary, he says this about this word rest. It is Christ's rest is not a rest 
from work. And this is kind of how we've looked at this word rest all along. You know, I, I don't have, I'm to rest from work. That's not what it's talking about. This word means something specifically. He says, Christ's rest is not a rest from work, but in work. Oh, grasp that for a second. In our work, we can have rest. I don't know about you, but I, I just say it this way. When I'm doing what I know I should be doing, fulfilling the call that God has on my heart, fulfilling his being obedient to him, I cannot find any greater place of rest. But when I'm disobedient to God, when I'm not doing what I should, should when I'm not doing, when I'm, let me pray for the interpretation here. When, <laughs> when I'm doing what I should not be doing, I'm skittish, you know? And, and I think that what Christ rests is this, is Christ is, he's come to me because as we come to him, we find our fulfillment in him. And when we find our fulfillment in him, we find our purpose in him. When we find our purpose in him, and when we obey him, there's a sense of rest because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And if we're going to be going through storms, and we all go through storms, we all go through storms. When we go through those storms, it's one thing to know that if I'm going through the storm because God has me going through the storm, or if this is a storm that I have created by my own way. I was uh, listening to the news today, and they were talking about the, the, the debt, credit card debt. Astronomical. They were saying that the debt, credit card debt is $17 trillion. Half of what our national GDP is. And now the interest rate is 20 or 25% on credit cards. And people are, don't have enough money now. They pay their rent with credit cards. They pay for food with credit cards and, and on and on and on. Well, some of our credit, we just go out and do stuff that we shouldn't do. Let's face it. And we build up debt. And then we, we sink under the debt, debt under the, the weight of that debt. That's of our own choosing. Certainly God will help us bring it about. But what we've got to understand is God already has a bunch of trials for us. I don't need that anymore. And so I need to come to him and say, Lord, put my life in order. And that's what we're talking about here. But let me finish this. Christ's rest is not a rest from work, but in work. Not the rest. I'm sorry, this is kind of blurry, but I didn't want to type it. I just took a picture of it. All right. Not the rest of inactivity, but of the harmonious working of all the faculties and affections of the will, heart, imagination, and conscience, because each has found in God the ideal sphere for its satisfaction and development. Now, let me put it this way. Rest is defined as being in the harmonious working of all my faculties and affections of will, heart, and imagination, conscience. He's saying this, when I'm at rest, all of the aspects of my life are in harmony. Now, I'm not talking about Zen Buddhism here where we all go, oh, I'm talking about our conscience, our heart, our mind, our will, our emotions are all in balance with God. That brings rest. And then he goes on, he says, because each has found in God the ideal sphere for its satisfaction and development. We are at rest when we are in harmony with God and our life is in harmony with his will, knowing this, that God is the source of my strength. God is the source of my life. God is indeed everything to me. And the closer I attach myself to God, the more at rest I will be. Does this all make sense? So right off the top, we're seeing that the essence of our being is from God. Therefore, the more we seek God, the more we understand ourselves. Why? Because remember, God breathed in man the breath of life. And that breath was just not the, it was the spirit of God that animated our life, which is what the spirit means, animated our life. And when he animated our life, he put himself in us, which means this, we are forever tied to God. And our fulfillment comes as we close, uh, as we close the gap between us. So rest 
if we want to have rest in the midst of the storm, it's going to be because we are pulling everything that we are, submitting it to God, and then allowing God to move himself within me and knowing that I will be indeed at rest. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. And rest is the harmonious, uh, 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 harmonious working of all my faculties, my mind, my will and emotions, and my affections of will and heart and imagination, conscience, because each has found in God the ideal severe for its satisfaction and development. So if we, we have to see that our rest comes as we draw nearer to God and allow God to change our hearts into him. Anybody have any comments up to this point? I mean, I could talk, but I'd like to hear you talk. Nobody? Okay. So what is peace? I love this definition. It's driven me for a long time. Peace simply means all is well. All is well. Your car can be broken down next to the, next to the highway, and you know your heart's at peace because you know God has you there for a strategic moment. And God, this is your plan. You could be dealing with a, a struggle in your life, maybe on your job, but you know that God is directing your life and you can have peace because you know all is well. You can be, you come from the doctor and he's just giving you bad news. You can have peace because your heart and your life belongs to the Lord and everything is in harmony with God's plan and God's will in your life. You can have indeed peace. In your heart. You can go through those storms with peace because you know all is well. I can't tell you how many times Debbie and I have gone through different things, but knowing this, I can't say it was easy, and, and, and but I can say this God had directed us. And after a while, you go, you know what? God's in this whole thing, and God will bring it to pass. And all will be well. Peace is not the beads hanging from your ceiling with incense and you're, you're going on. Oh, that's not peace. That's trying to create an ambiance of peace. It's an exterior formation or trying to deal with your environment to try and make it peaceful. But real peace comes from the inside. And so today we're going to be talking about ordering our private world. Why was Jesus able to be at rest even in the storm? Because he had rest and peace. He knew. He knew. Now remember, he was fully human and fully divine. People say, well, he was God. He could have done anything. He was still fully human. Remember when he sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Eden? What was that all about? Not Garden of Gethsemane. What was that all about? He was, he was anxious in his, human, in his humanity for that which was to come. And he prayed through and he was able to go to the cross because of his, his prayers that he did the night before in the garden regardless of whether anybody prayed with him or not, which he wanted. But they couldn't. They went to sleep. So Jesus was able to do that because he had rest and his peace. Let me tell you something. We can go through the storms as well because we have rest, knowing that all is in harmony with God, and we have peace, knowing that all is well. Now, I will say this. If all is not well because you've been in disobedience, this is where repentance comes in. So how can we possess these traits in our own lives, even in the midst of storms? That's what we're talking about. I read several years ago a book that changed my life, and I recommend it to you. It's called Ordering Your Private World. It's, why, it's the title of this book that I'm using as the title of this class. Now, I'm not using this book as for this class, except for a couple little parts. But I love the title so much, so I'm grasping it. How many of you have read this book, Ordering Your Private World? I suggest you get it. It's still out there. You can still buy it. And But Gordon MacDonald uh, really sets up a great thing here. And he was giving a story that I wanted to start off with today. A friend was an officer aboard a United States Navy nuclear submarine. He related to me an experience that happened one day while the sub was on duty in the Mediterranean. And many ships were passing overhead on the surface and the submarine was forced to make a large number of violent maneuvers to avoid possible collisions. I've often thought about that. You know, we were just on a cruise. You go, what's under the water here? 
<laughs> anyway, move on. All right. <laughs> Many ships were passing overhead, and they were forced to make large number of violent maneuvers to avoid collisions. In the absence of the captain, my friend was the duty officer in charge of giving the commands by which the submarine was positioned at each moment. Because there was such a sudden and unusual amount of the movement, the captain, who had been in his own quarters, suddenly appeared on the bridge, asking, Is everything all right? Yes, sir, was my friend's reply. The captain took a quick look around and then started back out through the hatch to leave the bridge. As he disappeared, he said, It looks all right to me, too. With just a few words and the abrupt exit, the captain conveyed his unqualified confidence in the duty officer's leadership. That simple routine encounter between a naval commander and one of his trusted officers provided me, the author, with a helpful picture of the order of one's private world. All around that submarine, the potential danger of collision was lurking. It was enough to make any alert captain show concern. But that danger was outside. Down deep inside the sub was, quiet, was a quiet place where there could be absolute control of the ship's destiny. And that was where the captain instinctively headed. On the bridge, the center of command, there was not a hint of panic. Only a calm, deliberate series of actions being carried out by a highly trained crew of seamen doing their jobs. Thus, when the commander appeared on the bridge to assure himself that everything was in order, it was. Is everything all right? He asked. Assured that it was, he looked about and agreed. It looks all right to me, too. He had gone to the right place and received the proper answer. This is how the captain organized his sub. I want you to grasp this. The appropriate procedures were practiced a thousand times when there was no danger. When there was no danger, they had practiced and practiced and practiced so that when there was danger, they knew how to respond. They knew what to do. Thus, when it was time for action in a precarious situation, there was no need for the captain to overreact. He could anticipate an excellent performance from the people on the bridge. When things are in order there, the submarine is secure no matter what the external circumstances. It looks all right to me too, he says the captain. So what we're talking about is very similar for our own hearts. When our hearts are secure, the exterior will not bother us because we will make the appropriate moves, the appropriate actions as a result of the obedience that we've given to God up to this point. So in order to get ready for the war, and those of you who have been in the military know that you don't prepare for war in the war. You prepare for war in advance of the war. Before the war even gets there, you get ready. And so what we need to do is we need to prepare our hearts even now. Now, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, where it talks about we are to edify one another even more as the day comes. Now, the word day is capitalized, D. That means this, speaking of the day of tribulation. And he's saying this, the closer we get to tribulation, the more we need to encourage one another. We don't, we don't wait till tribulation happens to encourage one another. We encourage one another even more as the day gets closer and closer and closer as we come to that point. And so he says here, in page 24, just as a wrap up, he says, development and maintenance of a strong inner world becomes the most important single function of our existence. The most important thing you could do is have a private world that's in harmony with God. Because times will come. And if you, wait to, if you wait till that time, it may be, I won't say too late, but you'll, have to, you'll be behind the eight ball. Excuse, excuse the analogy there, but you're behind the eight ball. You gotta, you're a race to catch a head. And so get yourself in your heart right with God. Now, I'm not just talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your heart in tune and connected to God. Right now I'm using this microphone. It's a wireless microphone. It's got a receiver on the camera there. And what's cool about it is you activate it, you start the microphone, and then it starts searching. And then when you activate the receiver, they connect. 
And this is what we do with God. When we get up in the morning or throughout the day, we, we start saying, here I am, God, and we connect with God. And then we can have peace in our hearts. Here's the question. How deep can a submarine go? It's classified. Classified. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. <Luke. laughs> You're right. It is classified. But how deep can a submarine go? What determines how deep a submarine can go? I'm sorry? The pressure of the, uh, the construction of the hull. Yeah, the shell. The hull. The, shell. the construction of the hull. The construction of the hull. He's absolutely right. The construction of what hull? Because there are two holes. A submarine has two holes. There's an inner hole, H-U-L-L, -L, and there's an outer hole. And what determines the depth is the integrity and the strength of the inner hull, not the outer hull. The outer hull has a purpose, but it's the inner hull that, and if that has cracks in it, if it's not built well, the more, the deeper and deeper it goes, the greater the pressure, the more likely it is to fail. And so if we want to indeed go deep in God, we we have to we have to re, if we want to reap the benefits of deep walk with God. How many of you say, "Oh, I want to go deep with God"? Have you ever heard that before? Oh, I just want a deep walk with God. Well, you got to strengthen that inner hole. If you're going to go deep in God, you got to strengthen that inner hole in your life. And and then secondly, if we're we are to be at ease in a topsy turvy world, we need to have a strong inner hole. And so what is it going to take to build that inner world of our lives so that we can indeed go through those moments? So in ordering your private world over these next weeks, we're going to be talking about a bunch of things. Living at ease in a topsy-turvy world does not mean that we hide away in a bunker, walled off from the world. Rather, we are to be a source of hope, a light, a lighthouse is built strong so that it can be a beam of light to, in the midst of the storm. We don't just, and many of us Christians have this thought. You know, Mormons, you know what they do? They, they collect food. And they collect food for whenever the end times come, they will be able to feed their families. That's honorable, I guess. But a Christian's response is different, isn't it? We prepare ourselves to be a beacon to the world that's lost. When the world is going through suffering and struggles, we, as the people of God, do something to touch their lives. And so we've got to come to grips with that. It's not that we just hide away and we stay ourselves, stay in church in order to, you know, be close to God in order to survive. We're not talking about survival. We're talking about going through the storms. And that's important because we will go through the storms. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What? I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You are, you are giving me the inner bracing that I need in my life in order to go through those times. So we need to be a beam of light in the midst of the storm. Anybody any comments up to this point? You're too quiet on me. Well, I found that, that you know, in today's world, there's just a lot of people that don't want to hear about God. That don't. So uh, I just found that the best thing that I can be is that light, is that example, that that uh, uh, what a Christian truly is. And what, why is that so important? He's right. Why is that so important? Because he's also right that the world doesn't want to hear about God. Until. Right? Until. And here's what we've got to be ready with. We've got to be ready so when the until happens, we can be there. We can be the lighthouse. When is the lighthouse at its best service? In the storm. I was thinking the other I was thinking today about a lighthouse. I like lighthouses. 
you know, they're, with some exceptions, they're basically round. Why? Because wind. So the wind is more. Waves go around them. Waves go around them. The winds go around them. The design of a lighthouse is designed to withstand the storm so that the light can shine. I got to tell you something. Is, that, is our calling any different? God has designed us by his Holy Spirit to be strong so that when the world is going through its crisis, we are there. In our life, and, and I got some verses here that we're going to talk about that. Ephesians, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Our light is best when it's dark. And we've got to be there with our light on. And the lighthouse keeper, he spends all day making sure that the light is trimmed and ready to go for the nighttime. It's too late in the nighttime. He's got to do it in the daytime so the light can shine at night. Are you getting the message here tonight? We've got to be ready in order to do what God wants us to do. So in Matthew, he says, you are the light of the world. Are you hearing this? You are the light. The world is topsy-turvy. You are the light. Don't get bogged down in politics. Don't get bogged down on whether we should have a debt ceiling or not. Don't get bogged down and argue and all this and that. Keep yourself above the fray so that the light, when they're in the midst of their storm, you can be a light to them. What am I trying to say here is you have a purpose in the midst of the storm. Jesus had a purpose in the midst of the storm. And that was to bring the peace that he had to bring peace in the storm. And that's what we are as well. And it goes on. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You see your good works. So, we are seeking to do what Jesus did in the midst of the storm. Be at peace that we may bring peace. Today, through these six weeks, we're seeking to be at peace so that we can bring peace. We're not to just be at peace. We have to bring, be at peace so that. Be at peace so that. So when the people in your workplace they're griping and complaining about this and that. You can bring peace to their hearts, peace to their lives. Don't you love this lighthouse? I love that lighthouse. I'm going to use this lighthouse over the next six weeks, and we're going to be talking about several things about how we are to lead up to the light. And I'll just give the outline right now. We're going to talk about how to be prepared. How to be prepared. We'll start that next week. We're going to be talking about the different spiritual disciplines, and we're building this lighthouse, all right? We're talking about spiritual disciplines. God has given to us through the scriptures disciplines that we can utilize in our life to help prepare us. Now, I've never been to boot camp, but my understanding is they wallop you. And the reason they wallop you is because they want you to be ready. They want you to be prepared. One of the things I, I know in the army, at least that I imagine everyone else, but they give you a gun and you have to take that, put that gun, take that gun apart and put it back together. Take that gun apart and put it back together. Take that gun apart and put it back together. Take that gun apart and put it back together. And take that gun apart and put it back together. They put you in a dark room, take that gun apart and put it back together. They shoot bullets over you, take that gun apart and put it back together. Why is that? Because when you're under fire in the battle, you can't be sitting there going, A goes into B, B goes into C. Does this go in there? When your gun jams, you've got to be able to take that thing apart and put it back together. And in our walk with the Lord, we've got to be able, and it's not just knowing the theology. I love that. It's not just knowing the theology, but it's having, remember the definition, having our hearts in harmony with the Lord. That's rest. 
So spiritual disciplines. What are the disciplines that God has given to us? Then what are some life disciplines that we can use? Give me a life discipline that every Christian should exercise. Yeah. Huh? Well, that's a spiritual discipline. What's a life discipline? Be healthy. Ooh. Did I have that apple pie earlier? <laughs> but God made apples. Oh, this is all right. <laughs> what are some life disciplines? And it, and it goes beyond just healthy. There's, there's other things we'll talk about. Understanding you. Who are you? I think this is so critical. Well, who are you? What drives you? What you know when we do when we do uh, I was talking with uh, Tina when Joe passed away and we're getting ready for the service. I said, did did Joe have any pet peeves? <laughs> he had some pet peeves. I was washing the dishes the other day, and uh, Joe did not like to stack dishes uh, after 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 a meal when somebody was there like my brother, and <laughs> he started collecting the dishes and and. Joe was kind of getting tense because he didn't like the dishes stacked. And I found out he didn't like the dishes stacked because now you have to wash both sides of the plate. Before you put them in the And I'm going, Before you put them in the no, yeah, no, all right, well, we don't use a dishwasher. <laughs> so I was washing the plate and I was looking, well, I hope you wash the other side of the plate. <laughs> but you see, we all have pet peeves. And it's not just pet peeves, but it's understanding who you are. Who you are. You see, once you understand you, it makes all the difference in the world on how you look. And when you understand you in light of Christ in your life, it brings an ease to your heart. Ease to your heart. You know, when you're older, it's easier to talk about this. When you're young, it's not. But understanding who you are, and we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about how to live as a called person. God has a call on your life. And how are you going to live as a called person? We're going to talk about that. As opposed to being driven. And those two things. He deals with this a little bit in his book, Ordering Your Private World. How, how to have the blessing of contentment. Living contented is such a peaceful way to go. And then we're going to be finishing it off with agape. And we're going to be finding out that each of these things increase our ability to love. And without doing these things, our ability to love, and we're going to define love. We're going to define what agape is. Huh? Okay. <laughs> anyway, it was good until he left. And anyway, agape. We're going to be talking about what agape is. People think agape simply means unconditional love. Way, way more than that. And so we're going to be talking about that as well in order to uh, begin to find order in our private world. And I think once we come to this grip of that, the impact that we have in our hearts and knowing that the, the little things that we do make a huge difference in our lives, I think, I think we can go with confidence. And even Jesus sleeping in the boat, I think, is a picture of the confidence that Jesus had. And we'll talk more about that over the next five weeks. Allow me to make some basic assumptions. And, I, and I'm, I'm not going to preach to you about salvation. I'm going to assume you already know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to assume that you are already... Now, if you don't have Christ in your heart, we could talk. But I want you to know right from the outset that, that even though I'm not talking about salvation over the next five weeks, today I want you to know salvation is everything. And if you don't have Christ in your heart, everything I'm going to talk about is going to fall on a very confused ears. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. Is the people that weren't of him, they didn't understand him. And that might happen to you today in these next several weeks. But I want you to know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. That's a basic assumption. Our the second assumption is our hope is found in him. Our hope is found in him. And, and so when we go through our struggles and we go through the, the tough moments of our time, of our life, we can look to him and he indeed will be our hope. Now, hope is, is something that we can hold on to because it's a truth. 
I was thinking about this today. You know, one of the, you know we talked about the the stuff that's going on in our world. Uh, the big thing that's happening in our world is the degradation of truth. The reason they call right wrong and wrong right is because there's no truth. And if there's no truth in their eyes, if there's no truth, who do you believe? And if everybody has their own truth, how do you enforce that? I was thinking about recently some, and I can't remember the congressperson, but they, they just admitted that they lied about such and so, and everybody's up in arms about it. And I'm going, why, are you so, why is everybody up in arms? He could, he could declare anything he wants. So what? If a person could declare he's a man one day and a girl the next, what's the problem? That's how convoluted it gets when you have no truth. So our hope is found in him, and the doorway of salvation leads to inner peace. And this is what we're talking about. The door of salvation leads when you take Christ in your heart. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent. Believe and repent. And you, the, the Lord Jesus, will cleanse you of your sin and, and then put you in relationship with him. And in putting you in relationship with him, you can have indeed peace. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Just a couple of quotes here. Your private prayer life is the most public thing that you will do. I learned this a long time as I was years and years and years ago. Fulton Buntain was the brother of uh, Mark Buntain. Uh, I don't know if you remember Mark Montain. He was a missionary in India, great missionary in India, and did tremendous work. But Fulton Buntain, his brother, said, said this statement, and I believe it. I was thinking the other, this today as I was watching a C-5 fly over. Did you work on C-5s? Maybe you can answer this question. As, I, as the C-5 was flying over, I, I heard somewhere, and maybe you can verify it for me, that for every hour a C5 flies, how much maintenance goes into that? For every hour, it used to be about six. With the new engines and everything, I don't know. Okay, so six hours for every hour, going by what he said, every hour a C5 flies, they have to spend six hours of maintenance. Now, I'm assuming that's man hours, all right? So six man hours of maintenance. For to keep that bird in the air. I want you to grasp that. Winston Churchill, whenever he would prepare a speech, he had a rule of thumb. For every minute he was to speak, he would spend an hour in study. Thank God for computers. It's helped quite a bit. But the principle has not changed. For, for every minute he would speak, he would spend an hour in preparation. For every hour that a C5 flies, six hours are spent on maintenance. My question to you is, how much is spent in your maintenance to prepare you for the life that you have? Just let that sink in for a second. Uh, I was talking with someone just the other day, and I was talking about public. I can't remember who I was talking to. Being in public. I like being in public. I like doing what I do. I love it. But I'll tell you, I'm kind of a 50-50 kind of guy. That means for every minute I'm in public, I have to have a minute to myself. Does that make sense? For every minute I'm doing my thing, I have to go back to the maintenance hangar and maintain, do something to maintain my heart. And I think that's a, there's a rule of thumb here. And to each of us, it's going to be a little different. But the point is that do something to maintain your heart as you prepare to go out into the world. Now, you may not be preaching. You may not be like Winston Churchill speaking. You may not be doing all those things, but you are engaging with your world. Do something to maintain your spirit, to maintain your heart, so that when you go out into that world, you can be strong. And you're not going, oh, my, oh, terrible, oh, my, my. You know what? The world doesn't need to hear that. What the world needs to hear is a light, a light that's bright in the midst of the storm of the world. So your private prayer life is the most public thing that you will do. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, 
you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. For those of you who remember the King James, I will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. So right here, right here, right in this one verse, we see that the answer to the tropsy turviness of our world and our place in it is keeping our mind on him, knowing that as we keep our mind on him, he will keep all of us in order. Now, I've always looked at this verse in terms of a compass. That compass is always pointing to true north or magnetic north. The compass is always pointing to north. And if we keep our compass always on the north of, of the Lord, then he will keep our path straight. He will direct us. Keep your mind stayed on him. The church cannot replace God in our lives. Now, I gotta, I gotta just pause here for a second and explain myself on this. Ask people, tell me about your walk with the Lord. Oh, I go to such and such a church. This church and any other church does not take the place of God in your life. I want you to hear me emphatically. This, because you come to this church does not mean you're going to be powerful. Now, I hope we facilitate it. I hope we're part of the solution. I hope that, that it breeds uh, uh, an environment whereby you are, you are drawn near to the Lord. But you cannot substitute coming to church as saying, I've been with God today. You can't, that, there's no substitute. Because God wants us to have a relationship with him that, transcends Sunday to Sunday to Sunday. Here's how I've always looked at it. I think what my, when my, I want my Sunday worship, if there was a scale of one to seven, I want my Sunday worship to be a seven. Every week I'm looking for a seven experience. How do I get a seven? Do I jump a little louder or jump a little higher? Do I shout a little louder? Do I yell amen at just the right time? When the preacher goes, hey, is there anybody out there? You go, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. Well, that was a seven. I think I've told you the story, but when we were in the South and we were in a buffet line, and God works in buffet lines. And there were two ladies, two ladies next to me as we put the potatoes and the corn. And, and uh, there's, oh, pastor was on fire today. That's what they said. He was so exciting. He was bowing back and forth across the stage and waving the Bible. The anointing was there. No. I'm not knocking that, okay? The anointing was there. And they just kept on and on and on. And I was young at that time. And I, and I didn't say what I wanted to say. Today I would say what I would say. Because I wanted to tell them, what did he say? It's not the jumping and the hollering and the hooting. Although I like the jumping and the hollering and the hooting. But if you're just jumping and a holler and a hooting and you count that as the anointing of God, you're sadly mistaken. We've got to come to grips with that church and what we do in church is not a replacement. It's an enhancement. I like to call it an inline pump. An inline pump takes water or oil, whatever. If there's a long run, they'll pump that so far and then they put a pump in the line in order to pump it more. Pumping on down the line. Well, I hope our church is an inline pump. We're not a hospital, by the way. I think we're a health club. There's a difference. We only go to the hospital when we're sick. You call somebody, pray for me, I'm in the hospital. I don't want the church to be just a place of the hospital. I want it to be a health club where people do something to maintain their bodies and the spirits and to be in a, in, in a, in a, in a, alive in the Lord. Are you with me so far? So the church cannot replace God in our lives. The act of spiritual formation is taking care of ourselves. Dallas Willard says this. I heard him say this recently, which is something he's passed away, but I was listening to a lecture of his. And he's right. When we're talking about spiritual formation, when we're talking about just spiritual, spiritual formation was a catchword some years ago, but it's really talking about growing and forming your spirit. He says, it's, it's something that we do ourselves. We take care 
of ourselves. Certainly God works through us, but we're the ones that have to pay the price to make sure that our spirits are, he are healthy before the Lord. So spiritual formation is something that we do to take care of ourselves. And then I'll finish this with this. Have you ever seen a healthy marriage? I was a pre-marriage counseling session recently, and I've never asked this question of a couple. I love pre-marriage counseling because they just, they love each other, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I love, and I love the, uh, I love asking them, you love each other? <laughs> Hold hands or smiling. And I said, all right, you, you love each other? Yes, we do. I, what, what is love? Ah, uh, I feel good. <laughs> well, love is much more than that. But I won't get into that right now. But one of the questions, I never asked this question before this last time. And I asked them, have you ever had, and they're in their mid-20s, have you ever had an example of a healthy marriage? Have you ever witnessed a couple that had a healthy marriage? What did they respond? No. He said no. She said, there was one couple, they were 70 years of age, some years ago. That hurt me. Here we have a young couple. They love each other. They want to get married. But they have had no model of how to fashion their marriage. Nobody showed them. Nobody showed them how to get along with each other, how to struggle through things together. Nobody showed them what love, how love is lived out. Nobody showed them. And But they want to get married. They, they have this ideal of, yeah, we want to get married, but how is that going to work out? How does that live out? Now, certainly, hopefully, in my conversations with them, it helps, but certainly not like somebody who actually modeled it to them and showed them what it's all about. Now, why am I bringing this up to you? Because it's a sad, sad story. What makes a sad story to us is that I believe there's people in the church who've never had a good model of what it means to follow Christ. And we have that responsibility. You and me have the responsibility to show what it means to follow Christ. And I think we have the opportunity over these next five weeks to really make a difference in our own hearts. <clears throat> that we would make a, 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 be a light in our world. And I want you to pray with me that we will see God do something in us individually. All right, I got three minutes left. Just enough time for you to ask any questions or give any comments. Anybody? Well, <clears throat> Oh, I thought you wanted to say something, Mary. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yes. Uh, what is your definition of a healthy marriage? Well, this is not a class on marriage. But a healthy marriage, to me, is, is two people, a husband and a wife, who, have, who are bound together. And in that bind, they become a force of engagement to a world. Certainly, they raise children. Certainly, they, they impact. But... The, 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 I think a healthy marriage is a, is a team working on a common goal. Debbie and I, we've had, I believe, a healthy marriage. And it's not, it has, hasn't always been great. I mean, she hasn't agreed with me every time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what makes, what makes, I believe, our marriage exciting is that we've had a commonality of goal, commonality of vision. Indeed, our whole family was involved with our vision. And so we had something to talk about over the dinner table. We would laugh. Debbie and I, can I tell them about my new book? 
<laughs> Every night we go to bed, and in the morning, or in the morning when we wake up, and we just talk and we laugh about this and that, and talk about the day ahead, and talk about what's happened to this and that. Just the engagement of each other, involved in each other's life. Wow, it's fun. And so I want to write a book, and I call it Stories from Between the Sheets. <laughs> and, and then, and other fables. <laughs> and other fables, yes. So, what I, what, you know, what's a healthy marriage? I think it's two people coming together to be honorable to the Lord and to lift each other up as we move forward in life and forward in the joy and in the tough moments. And it's, it's interesting. It's what you got to have, you got to have the joy in order to go through the tough moments. Right? You got to, and there will be tough moments. So again, that's, that's, that's just an off the top definition. Let me pray over you. I pray, Father, that this moment as we launch out into this journey, that you will begin to work on our hearts, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our identity in you. Strengthen us, Lord, that we would indeed be at rest in the midst of a topsy-turvy world, but be at rest for a purpose, that we would be a light of the love of the Lord to a world that needs you. And work on our hearts even now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. you. See you next week. And bring a friend.